In July of 1975, I got down on one knee right in front of Kay McLean, and I asked her to marry me. To my utter relief, <laughs> she said yes. And after we embraced, I asked her if we could drive to Trinity Church in, there in Natchez, Mississippi, where I was working. She looked at me mystified and a little miffed, but she agreed, and we drove over to the church. And then we walked up to the altar, and we knelt down there, and I took her hand, and I asked God to bless our covenant. I knew um, from my reading of the Bible that uh, marriage was a lot more than a promise between two people. It was a covenant. Um, and after 45 years of marriage, I see uh, it's true. Covenant is strong, and it's one of the very strong themes that runs through the Bible. There's covenant, salvation, the spirit, and the kingdom of God. There's more, I'm sure, but those four seem to predominate. You know, the story of the Bible begins in a garden. God is present to his people there. Uh, with a certain immediacy, he walks in the garden in the cool of the evening, it's written. Uh, and he gives the first two people work to do. He says, I want you to till the garden and take care of it, and I want you to obey me. Uh, in effect, God makes Adam and Eve priest, priest of his world, of his tabernacle. The garden really is set up like his sanctuary where he, where he is present. Of course, Adam and Eve uh, start a long line of us that have kind of fallen in our priestly duties, but God's covenant remains. You may remember when uh, Moses leads the people of Israel out of uh, bondage in, in Egypt. Uh, and they get to the base of Mount Sinai about two weeks later, and God uh, tells Moses to tell the people this, uh, I am the Lord your God. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And so it goes on to the Ten Commandments. God wasn't necessarily given people a prescription uh, of do's and don'ts as much as he was saying, my covenant is in effect. I love you enough to deliver you. Um, I ask you to serve me and to obey me. In the New Testament, of course, the most poignant example of covenant is uh, when our Lord on the night before he is uh, arrested and will be tortured and, and ridiculed and tormented and and then crucified, he takes bread, and he takes wine, and he gives it to the disciples. He said, this bread I break, it's my body that's broken for you. This blood, uh, this wine is poured out for you. It is a sign that my covenant is in effect, and there is no length. I will not go to love you. Very much like Salvation, uh, the second theme, is a, a much broader term than we usually give it, uh, uh, give it in, in our uh, Christian parlance. I mean, so often we think of salvation as uh, we push the button on the up elevator uh, after we die and we go to heaven. Well, that seems a little trivial to me. Salvation in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testaments, is, well, is to get well to be made whole. Uh, it is God's rescue of us. Uh, perhaps uh, you can remember Moses again as he leads the people of Israel uh, out, of, out of Egypt and they're at, uh, at the Red Sea and their, their backs are against the Red Sea and they can see the, the dust of the Egyptian army coming after them and the people are terrified, as you would imagine. And Moses Rather than telling them to run for their lives or go hide, he says, Nah, lift up your heads and look. The soldiers you see coming to see you today, you will never see again. The Lord 
that God is going to deliver you. He is going to save you and give you a new life. Um, and of course, that is what Jesus tells us. Uh, St. Paul, the first writer in the New Testament, uh, understood this better than any. Uh, in, in the uh, letter to the Ephesians, uh, he says, By grace you have been saved by faith. And this is not your doing, but it is a gift from God. And he goes on to say, Don't you know that you're God's workmanship? And you've been made to do good works. You see, we are saved in order to live fulfilling lives, creative lives, giving lives, the lives that we really want has nothing to do really, whether people write our name in history books. It has to do with, well, with the heart overflowing out of love and gratitude for God that expresses itself in doing, doing those things for others and making the world, well, making God's tabernacle a better place. Then there's the Spirit. You know, with the second verse of the Bible, it says the Spirit was hovering over the, the waters, the chaotic waters, and then God speaks and begins to create. The Spirit is His creative agent. Later, God will, in the second chapter of Genesis, He will take some mud and He will just kind of, you know, fashion it. I always imagine Him taking mud out of the bottom of the river and going, you know, he's kind of making this nice little, this little figure. And then he goes, and the mud, the dirt becomes a living being. Adam, the, is made out of Adama. He is the earth man. But it takes the spirit to animate him. In the New Testament, Jesus um, goes down to the river Jordan uh, on the outskirts, on the way out in the boonies of Israel. And his second cousin is baptizing. And when Jesus goes down to the water and he's baptized, it says the Spirit alit on him. And then he becomes Spirit-driven. If you read the language of the Gospels, it says the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. The Spirit led Jesus here and there. He is the Spirit-led man. And then... When he is about to be executed and the disciples are looking blue and like, okay, this is the end of the road. He said, oh, no, 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 don't be sad that I'm leaving. He said, because if I don't go, the Spirit will be given to you and the Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I've told you. We then become the Spirit-driven people. What did, uh, what did uh, Teilhard de Chardon say? We are not human beings having a spiritual experience, but we're spiritual beings having a human experience. <laughs> that old Jesuit scientist is one smart character. We are charismatic human beings. And then finally, there's the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is always making its way into our, into our world. Uh, you know, what is uh, the prophet Amos? He's a curmudgeonly prophet, if you read the prophets, and he's at the top of the list of the grumps. But at one point, he breaks off, and in, 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 in great tenderness, he says, Israel, you alone I have known amongst all the families of the earth. I have anointed you as my kingdom ambassadors. You are this community, my kingdom here on earth. Jesus takes this, uh, uh, this, uh, this theme and it is what he talks about most in the New Testament. The kingdom of God is at hand, he says. Repent and believe in the good news of the kingdom. <laughs> um, God's world is always, is always making entreaties into our own. And any time we humble ourselves to him, we begin to be part of the kingdom and experience the kingdom, and we become kingdom ambassadors. Jesus says, to live in the kingdom is like finding a treasure in a field. And when you find it, you won't 
You want to buy the whole field. So you sell everything you have in order to be part of that. We were meant to live well in that, uh, in that intimate presence with God, just like Adam and Eve were offered. You see, that's kingdom living. That's kingdom living. And so the story of the Bible begins in a garden, but it ends in an immense city. And in the middle of the city is a throne. And on that throne sits a lamb, a slaughtered lamb. God Almighty, who has sacrificed everything out of love for us. The message of the Bible is whole. And it tells us that we're loved beyond measure.